بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحديث السابع حديث نمبر سبن عن أبي رقية تميم بن أوسن الداري رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الدين النسيحة الدين النسيحة الدين النسيحة قلنا لمن يا رسول الله قال لله ولكتابه ولرسوله ولأئمة المسلمين وعامتهم رواه مسلم from this hadith which is narrated by Imam Muslim from Abu Ruqayya the father of Ruqayya Abu Ruqayya that's his kunya his real name Tamim <coughs> ibn Aws Ad-Dari Tamim ibn Aws Ad-Dari who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said الدين النصيحة the religion this religion is a نصيحة which I think you should have the translation as sincerity even though we have to explain that but the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says الدين النصيحة the religion is sincerity and then he said لله for Allah and for his book and for his messenger and for the leader or the leaders of the Muslims and the Muslims in general. Again, this hadith is narrated by Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim in his Sahih. It is hadith number 55. Hadith number 55 in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. This hadith is also narrated by Imam Tirmidhi from Abu Huraira and it's also narrated from other ways other books from the hadith of Ibn Umar and Thawban and Ibn Abbas and other Sahaba and other Sahaba now Abu Ruqayya that's his kunya the father of Ruqayya like we went through the first hadith the kunya of Umar Ibn Al-Khattab was what? Abu Hafsa. This shows you that, like we said before, there is no problem of taking your kunya by your daughter. Even though um, generally, mostly, people take the kunya by their sons. Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdurrahman, Abu Muhammad, Abu Ahmad, Abu Yusuf, Abu Nuh, Abu Adam, And Abu Umar, of course. That is the general one, you know, usually. But there's no problem with taking kunya by your daughter. Like Umar bin Khattab used to be Abu Hafs. Umar bin Khattab used to be Abu Hafs. Tamim bin Aws is Abu Ruqayya. There's nothing wrong. Tayyib. Tamim ibn Aws ad-Dari radiyallahu anhu is one of the sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu obviously he became Muslim in the ninth year meaning two years before the Prophet sallallahu passed away he used to be Christian before Christian he used to wear a cross there's a hadith where he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and he was wearing his cross and the Prophet sallallahu was reading the ayah in surah al-tawbah ittakhadu أَحْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Allah says in Surah Al-Tawbah, they, meaning the Christians and the Jews, they have taken their priests and their rabbis to be gods besides Allah. That's what the ayah in Surah Al-Tawbah says. Tamim ibn Aws, who was then still a Christian, wearing his cross, when he came to the Prophet Sallam, the Prophet Sallam said to him, أَلْقِ عَنْكَ هَذَا الْوَثَنِ يَا تَمِيمِ Throw this idol away. Take out this idol. 
The Prophet ﷺ, that's what he said to him. Al-ka'anka hadhal, al-wathan. Throw away this idol. Why are you still wearing this? That tells you, it is not permissible for a Muslim to wear a cross. And if you wear it, while well, you're pleased with it. You say it's okay, that is kufr. You have disbelieved in Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you wear it unintentionally, you don't know, you just think it's style. You're committing a major sin. And when you're told this is a cross, don't wear it, you should take it out immediately. Because that is one of the main signs, if not the main sign of kufr and shirk. The cross. And the cross comes in different shapes and sizes. There's the Victorian cross, there's this cross, there's that cross. It doesn't all have to be that the vertical part is longer than the horizontal part. No, it doesn't have to be like that. They used to be creative when they drew their cross, which is a sign of their religion. Some of my young brothers and older brothers also, you wear clothes which have, cro which have crosses on them. It's not allowed to wear that. It's kufr. If you're pleased with that, it's kufr. How are you going to pray with that? How are you going to pray with that? For those of you who like Soccer, as you call it in North America. It's called football. You wear your Brazil jersey. Brazil, their, their badge is a cross. Portugal, their badge is a cross. Sweden, their badge is a cross. Norway, their badge is a cross. Finland, their badge is a cross. England, their badge is a cross. Or sometimes these days they put the three lions, which is alhamdulillah. But inside, they put the cross. Or on the shoulders. AC Milan. Their badge is a cross. Barcelona. Their badge is a cross. Real Madrid. On top of the crown, they have a cross. And we can go on and on. It is not allowed. It is haram for you as a Muslim to put that on. And if you know, now you know it's a cross. And you still put on it. Wallahi, I fear you're not a Muslim anymore. I fear you're not a Muslim anymore. Because now you're wearing it intentionally, willingly. Those clubs, football clubs in those countries, are Christian countries, those football clubs that... They were, they, were, they were initiated and founded by people who used to be staunch Christians. That's why they had to put it in their badge as a sign of representing who they are. But you as a Muslim, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Or some of those clothes where you don't even know, they put those signs for you, a cross, big cross, Swiss army, whether you have a Swiss army bag or a Swiss army knife, whatever it is, Swiss army is a cross. It's a cross because Switzerland, their flag is a cross. It's a, they, they brag they're a Christian country. You have to pay attention. You have to. Pay attention. So anyway, the point is Tamim al-Dari, radiallahu anhu, when before he was a Muslim, he came to the Prophet ﷺ wearing this cross. The Prophet ﷺ said, throw this idol. Then he said, he said, oh Muhammad, I have heard you saying these words. Those words were what? The ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Tawbah. They have taken their priests, meaning the Christians, and their rabbis, meaning the Jews, they have taken the priests and the rabbis to be gods besides Allah. He says, I've heard you saying this, but we don't take them to be gods. It was as if Tamim was trying to say to the Prophet, your Quran is wrong. Your Quran says we take them as gods, but we don't take them as gods. We don't worship them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said what? Afala yuharrimuna ma ahallallahu fatutu'uhum. وَيُحَرِّمُونَ مَا أَحَلَّهُ اللَّهُ فَتَطِيعُهُمْ قَالَ نَعَمْ قَالَ فَتِلْكَ عِبَادَتُهُمْ The Prophet said to him, Don't they make haram what Allah has made halal and you follow them? And they make halal what Allah has made haram and you follow them? He said yes. He said that is worshipping them. 
That is worship. You have made them to be gods. The one who is the one who is the shari'ah. The one who makes the law. The legislator is Allah alone. In il hukmu illa lillah. Afaghayra hukmu Allah yabghun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Do they want a law, a guide, a, a, a judgment which is other than Allah? He said when, so, so when someone comes, Allah says drinking is haram. Someone comes and says no, he says halal. And you follow him while well, you know. You have taken him to be a God. Because part of Godhood is that the God, he makes the laws also. But later on, Alhamdulillah, Allah guided Tamim ad dar and he became a Muslim. This is the only hadith he has in Sahih Muslim. He did not narrate a lot of hadith. As you have heard, he, he, he became Muslim in the ninth year. The Prophet died in the, the tenth year. Only one hadith in Sahih Muslim, but it's a great hadith. Great hadith. And he has one special excellence which no other Sahaba has, we can say. Who knows that? Naam Adam. Let, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you answer, before you answer that. Before you answer that. We have, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Oh Allah, save us from Ain. The evil eye. Save us from the evil eye. We have goodies here. You answer. Oh, there's a lot of Kit Kat. MashaAllah. One for the teacher, I think. Only young people. You answer correctly. You get something. Okay. What is the special thing? Oh, see, he came closer. MashaAllah. <laughs> what is the special thing he had? Yes. It's related to that, but what is what, what made him special? It is related to that. I can give you a clue. This is a difficult question. Yes. No, that doesn't make him special. The thing which makes him special is that the Prophet وسلم, he took that narration from him. The Prophet did not see the Dajjal. But Tamim is the one who saw the Dajjal. So the Prophet وسلم, took hadith from, from Tamim. That's how special it is. The Prophet وسلم, he took the hadith from who? From Tamim. Tamim ad Dari, you know the story? Dabi Maddari and his companions, his friends, they went out to sea in a ship. And then they got capsized and they were taken by the sea to this island. It's a long hadith. And they made the Jassasa there, then they made the Dajjal in chains. And the Dajjal spoke to him and asked him questions. Has that prophet of the Arabs come? And, and, and. To the, and then when Tamim came back, he told the Prophet ﷺ, this is what we saw. When he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called all the people of Medina. He called everyone to the masjid. And he said to them, listen to what Tamim Ad-Dari has to say. Did I not used to tell you this about the Dajjal? Now listen to him. That is special. That is special. Now Tamim Ad-Dari, radiallahu anhu, he says in this hadith, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the deen is nasiha. And in the mustakhraj of Abu Awana, the mustakhraj of Abu Awana, another book of hadith. The mustakhraj of Abu Awana is a book of hadith where Abu Awana, one of the famous scholars of hadith, he brought the same Hadith which Muslim brought, but by different narrations, different chains. Abu Awana, he took the same hadith Muslim brought, but he brought them with his own chain. In that narration of Abu Awana, he says, the Prophet ﷺ said this three times, Ad-Dinun Nasiha, Ad-Dinun Nasiha, Ad-Dinun Nasiha. The religion is nasiha. The religion is nasiha. The religion is nasiha. Now this gives you a different meaning. 
it shows you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking about something important. Because he will only repeat something which is very important three times. This religion is nasiha. This religion is nasiha. This religion is nasiha. And then he kept quiet. And the Sahaba, they got the point that this something is very, very important. This thing is very important. That's why he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he repeated it three times. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, Liman, you said the religion is Nasiha, but to who? Because Nasiha is something which has to be directed to someone else. That's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi answered them by saying, Lillahi, for Allah, wali kitabih and his book, wali rasulih and his messenger, wali aimmatil muslimin and the leaders of the Muslims, wa ammatihim and the the general folk of the Muslims. Now what is nasiha? Because once you understand the word, then we can go into the hadith. And nasiha, in the meaning which is brought in the hadith, and nasiha, if you first go to the origin of the word, the origin of the word, in Arabic. The origin of the word in Arabic is nasaha. When you say nasahtul asala, nasahtu that word, nasahtul asala, it means I purified the honey, I cleansed the honey. Nasahtul asala, I purified, I cleansed the honey. That's the meaning of the of the word. So it means what? To clean and to purify. Calm down. Relax. Calm down. Calm down. Go get Awali or Hassan. Quick, you. He's coming. Okay. Relax. Focus on the dars. Nasahtul Asala means what? I purified, I cleansed the honey. Mina Shama'a from the from the wax. Because the bee has to make the the wax, and from the wax you take the honey. That's how the word is actually used. To cleanse something. From the honeycomb. Jazakallah khair. To cleanse and to purify something. It is also used. In Arabic, when you say nasahtu thawba, it is also used to mean I mend or I repaired the cloth. When a cloth gets torn, you say nasahtuhu, I mended it, I sew it, I put it together, I repaired it, I patched it up. That is also the meaning of this word in Arabic language. Okay? Two meanings. What are the two meanings? I cleansed it and purified it and I repaired or fixed it. That is the linguistic meaning, the origin of the word in Arabic language. Now what does it mean here? Can we apply it here? Ad-deenun nasiha. The deen is nasiha to who? Nasiha to Allah. And to his prophet, to his book, to his prophet, to the end. What is intended here? As the scholars have explained, they say. And I will just summarize it for you so you understand it very well. It is for you, the one who is the nasih. The person who has the nasiha is called the nasih. The nasih is the one who shows nasiha. The one you show it to is called the mansuh. You have the nasih and the mansuh. It is for you. To obligate yourself with a pure heart. In taking care and preserving the right of the mansuh. I will repeat it three times. It is for you to fulfill 
with a pure heart the right of the person. The mansuh, you can call it that. And the mansuh here are five things. Allah, his book, his messenger, the leader of the Muslims and the general folk. It is for you to fulfill your duty with a clean heart to the person who is the mansuh. That is the meaning of nasiha. And all the Arabs have said this word nasiha in, in Islamic terminology. There is no explanation for it by one word. You cannot explain it by one word. So what is it? It is for you to fulfill the right or the duties which are upon you for the person who you are showing nasiha to. And you do that with purity. Because that's the origin of the word. So when we say nasiha to Allah, the Prophet says that deen is the deen is nasiha. They say to whom? He says to Allah. So what does it mean? Is that for you, you fulfill your duties and the rights of Allah with a clean pure heart. Then he said to his book, what does it mean? It is for you to fulfill the rights of the book of Allah which you have. And you do that with a clean heart. Then he says to his prophet, what does that mean? Nasiha to his prophet, what does it mean? Is that you, 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 obli you, you fulfill the obligation which you have towards the Prophet Sallallahu with a clean heart. And you do it in the best way. That's like the meaning of the word is what? Nasahtul Asla, I purify, I cleanse the honey. Honey is already good enough, but you have to clean it. Likewise, when you do that obligation, those rights they have on you, do it in the best way. Then he said, Nasiha to the leader of the Muslims is for you to observe and to fulfill the rights they have, the obligations you have upon they have upon you with a clean heart. And then to the general Muslims. So what does Nasiha mean? It is for you to fulfill the obligations you have towards those things which have been mentioned. Nasiha to Allah, to his book to his messenger, to the leader of the Muslims, leaders of the Muslims and the general Muslim. Is it clear enough? Is it clear enough? So the explanation itself is what? Is nasih. The explanation itself is clear, I think. So we start one by one. The Prophet ﷺ, says that Deenu Nasiha, the Deen is Nasiha. Three times he said that. They ask to whom, Ya Rasulullah? Because they know Nasiha is fulfilling those obligations towards someone. So they say to who? That's the question they asked. So the Prophet ﷺ informed them to Allah. Then to his book, Allah's book. Then to his Prophet, Allah's Prophet, meaning himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he said to the leaders of the Muslims. Then he said what? To the general Muslims. So how do you fulfill that nasiha to Allah? What does nasiha to Allah mean? What does nasiha to Allah mean? Now before we go ahead, and this is one of the examples that comes in this meaning of nasiha to Allah. Allah, he used this word in the Quran. He used this word in the Quran. Like we said, it means what? To fulfill the obligations to the person you have. And it also means, because one of the obligations we have is to advise the Muslims which will come. Allah he used it when he mentioned his prophets. What did Nuh alayhi salam say? Salih alayhi salam, what did he say to his people? Huh? What did he say? Sorry? Inni lakum nasihun ameen. I am to you someone who's nasih, ameen, and trustworthy. Nasih meaning what? I am fulfilling my duty towards you, which is part of, part of it is what? To give you the message of Allah. To give you sincere advice. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned also about the Sahaba. When he said, Laysa ala du'afai, wala ala al-lazina, wala ala al-marda, wala ala al-lazina la yajiduna ma, ma yunfiquna harajun idha, idha nasahu lillahi wa rasuli. Ma ala al-muhsinina min sabil. Allah says in Surah Tawbah again, when he was mentioning that the mush, that, sorry, the, the munafiqun, they give excuses not to go to fight with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then Allah say, and Allah, he, he rebuked them and he mentioned them with the worst characteristic. He said, these people are going to hellfire. But then Allah, he made an exception. He says, no, not everyone who does not go out with you, he's going to be punished or he's a munafiq. No, Allah gave them excuses. He said, what? Laysa ala ala du'afai. ولا على المرضى ولا على الذين لا يجدون ما ينفقون three groups the weak people who cannot fight the sick people who cannot fight and the people who don't have anything to go to fight with Allah says those people there's no haraj on them there's no blame on them when though when they have nasiha to Allah and His Messenger, they have no blame, even if they don't go to fight. What does this nasiha mean here? When they have fulfilled their duty to Allah and His Messenger, when they are sincere to Allah and His Messenger. They wanted to go, they want to help the religion of Allah, but they are weak. They cannot do it. In their heart, the nasiha is there. But the action of nasiha, they don't have it. Allah says they're excused. He is sick. He wants to go to fight for the deen of Allah. But he has no means. He cannot. He's sick. Inside, he wants to go. Allah says this one is excused. He's someone who has nasiha in his heart for Allah and his messenger. This other one, he has health and he is not weak. But he has nothing to go with. No camel, no sword, nothing to go with. Allah says those people, as long as their hearts are pure, then there's no problem with them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he said, Ma ala al -muhsinina min sab He called them muhsinin, people who do good. And I think there's a secret why Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, he brought this hadith after the hadith of last week, which ended by saying what? Ala inna fil jasadi mudgha. There's a piece of flesh in the body. If it is clean and pure, the whole body will be pure and clean. Because nasiha starts from the heart. It starts from the heart. So he says, Lillahi, nasiha to Allah. What does nasiha to Allah mean? Number one, that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is the only God and you believe that he is the only creator and he is the only provider and he is the only one who is the controller of this universe and he is the only one who can take care of your affairs and he is the only one who can solve your problems and that he is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. That is nasiha to Allah. You fulfill your duty towards Allah. That is your duty. That you believe in Him the right way. That He is the tr true, perfect, only God. And that is not enough. Then it goes practical that you actually worship Him alone. That all your acts of worship, salah, zakah, slaughtering, dua, dhikr, you only direct them to Allah. That is nasiha to Allah. Remember it is what? Purity. So you have to purify the obligations which are for Allah, only for Allah. That is nasiha to Allah. And that you love what Allah loves. And that you hate what Allah hates. And that you love the people Allah loves. And that you hate the people Allah hates. And that you give only for the sake of Allah and that you hold back only for the sake of Allah that is nasiha for Allah 
And when, after explaining this now, you see most people, they translate nasiha as what? Sincere advice. How do you give sincere advice to Allah? It doesn't make sense. This is the meaning of nasiha. You sincerely fulfill your obligations towards Allah. So when problems happen to you, ya yeah, Muslim, when problems happen to you, who do you turn to? Who do you turn to? You go to the grave of your peer or your maulana. Or you start calling Abd Qadr Jailani, help me, help me. Or you start calling Ya Ali, Ya Hussein, A'udhu that is shirk. Kufrum billah. Kufr. When problems happen to you, are you from the, from the ones who go to the magician? He says, oh, he can solve my problems. He can tell me, a'udhu billah, kufrum billah. When problems happen, are you the one who slaughters for the jinn? He says, you know, they told me I should slaughter for the jinn. Kufrum billah. An nasiha, which is obligatory on you towards Allah, is that you direct your worship, all of them, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah lillahi dinul khalis. To Allah belongs the deen which is pure. And that brings us to the second part of nasiha for Allah. Complete ikhlas. Whatever you do, whatever you do, which is ibadah, you do it for him. Otherwise, you have not fulfilled nasiha to Allah. Otherwise, you have not fulfilled the nasiha to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Kabura kalimatan takhruju min afwahihim in yaquluna illa kathib. What an evil word which comes from their mouth. Who are these people? In yaquluna illa kathib, they only say lies. Who are these people? Those who say Allah has taken a son, the Christians. Allah says, what an evil word. Allah says, these are my enemies. Allah says they have my curse on them. Waliyadhan billah. Allah has cast them. How can you as a Muslim love that person who is a kafir? Allah has cast him. How can you as a person glorify that symbol of saying Allah is three years a son? How can you glorify that cross? From nasiha to Allah is that you love what you love and you hate what he hates. You love the people Allah loves and you dislike and hate the people Allah dislikes and hates. Otherwise, you have not completed the duty you have, the nasiha for Allah. Second, he says, and nasiha to his book. The book of Allah, Al-Quran Al-Azim. The mighty book of Allah. What does it mean to have nasiha to the book of Allah? We said what does nasiha mean? To fulfill the obligation or the rights which the Quran has on you. And you do that completely with a clean heart. Number one, that you believe it is the book of Allah. It was sent down by him. It is the final message which will ever come to humankind. And you believe every single word which is in there. Every single word which is in there, you have to believe in it. Otherwise, if you take some and you leave some, you will become like the kuffar of old. Are you going to believe some of the book and disbelieve in some of the book? When you do that, you have not fulfilled the nasiha to the book of Allah. That you believe in everything Allah has said in that book. You know with a clean, pure, 101% heart, this is the truth. Even if I cannot understand it, this is the truth. And from the nasiha to the book of Allah is that you read it 
haqqa tilawati you read it the right way is supposed to be recited and this means three or four different things you read it you recite it the right way number one you give it its due time you have to have a time for the quran you have to otherwise you have not had nasiha to the quran you have become one of those persons who have done hijran of the Quran. You have abandoned the Quran. Number one, reciting it. Number two, which is connected to that, you have to recite it the right way. You have to be taught. You have to be taught. You recite it the right way with the proper rules, ahkam. You don't have to be a master in tajweed. No. But you have to know the basics so that you don't change the meanings. There's no lahnul jali, clear mistakes which you make, which anyone can know. This from the nasiha of the book of Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What? Rattil al Qur'ana, tartila, recite it the right way. Number three, from nasiha in the recitation of the book of Allah, you memorize it. You memorize it because the heart, and we talked about last week, from the things which give you that clean, upright heart. We talked. What are some of the ways to have a clean heart? We said the Quran is the best cure of the heart. The heart which has no Quran, it's like a ruins. You see ruins? Houses which are broken down. Ghost houses like we call them. Nobody lives in there anymore. That is the heart with no Quran. Broken house, nothing. Every time you increase in your memorization of the Quran, every time your heart becomes stronger. Stronger. And cleaner. And you're fulfilling that nasiha you have to give the book of Allah. And we discussed here. The excellence of the Hamalat al Quran. The Hamalat al Quran. Those people who memorize and they teach and they learn the Quran. Khairukum, the Prophet says, The best of you, man ta'allam al Quran, the one who learns the Quran, memorizes it, reads it, recites it properly, knows the meaning, and then he teaches it to others. I'm surprised. Some people come and say, Sheikh, I want to study hadith, I want to come muhadith. First question, which I have been I have been taught, and I used to make the same mistake, and I saw many people when they used to come to our Sheikh Sheikh Abdul Azim. He'll ask them one thing, and so almost every Sheikh I saw, he'll ask one thing. Anyone who comes to say that, he'll ask him, "How much Quran do you know? Have you memorized?" Says one Jews, "You have one Jews. You want to." <laughs> to busy yourself in hadith. Go learn the Quran. Because the Quran is the asas, the foundation. And this is how the Salaf, the Sahaba, they learned. First you teach the children Tawheed. When they're young, when they're young, they have to be taught Tawheed. Then they learn the Quran. Then comes the Sunnah. Then comes the statements of the scholars, the ara, opinions, madhabs. Later on, first you fill your heart with wahi, revelation from Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِشَةً ضَنْكَ The one who turns away from my dhikr, my, my Quran, he shall have a difficult life. And to show the excellence of the Hamalat al Quran, the Prophet says that, Ya Ummun Nas, Aqara'uhum li kitabillah. The Imam of the people should be the one who knows the Quran better than all of them. Even when they die, like the Shuhada of Uhud, we talked about them today in the Khutbah. There were 70 of them were killed. They could not dig a grave for each of them, so they used to bury them, two or three of them. The Prophet would ask, Ayyuhum akhtharu akhthan li kitabillah. Which of these two he used to know the Quran more than the other? 
فَإِذَا أُشِيرَ إِلَيْهِ When he's pointed, he says, قَدِّمُهُ Put him first in the grave. Even in the grave, the people of the Qur'an, they are the first. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ أَهْلِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah has his special people on earth. Special people. The Sahaba, because they love to do good. Just like in this hadith, they said, Ya Rasulullah, man who, who are these people? Why do you think the Sahaba, they ask this question? Because they want to be from those people. When he says, Ad-Dinu Nasiha, they say, to whom, Ya Rasulullah? We want to practice it. He says, Hum Ahlul Quran, Ahlul Allah wa khasati. The people of the Quran, they are the special people of Allah. That's why Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he says what? كان القراء أصحاب مجلس عمر كهولا كان أو شبانا. He says the council of Umar, when Umar was Amir al-Mu'minin, the lead of the believers, the lead of this great empire from China all the way up into Europe, all the way down into Africa. Every leader has what? A council. Today we call them? ministers or the advisory board whatever you call it the cabinet ibn abbas you know what he says the cabinet the council of umar it used to be the people of the quran whether you are young or old it doesn't matter for umar you know the quran and the sunnah well you sit here and I explain to this this story to you some time ago you want it again I know you like stories. I'll give you a story. Ibn Abbas used to be very young. When, he, when the Prophet ﷺ died, Ibn Abbas was how old? 10 or 13. So by the time Umar was Khalifa, you add another 14 years. He's barely 30. Barely. So the Kibar Sahaba, the, the major Sahaba, they used to say to Umar, Ya Umar, what is wrong with you? Inna lana abna mithnihad. We have children just like him, just like Ibn Abbas. Why do you make him sit with us? Why do you make him sit with us? So Umar Rabbi Anhu, he was a wise man, amazing. He said to him, Inni sa'ilukum, I'm going to ask you something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ida ja'a nasrullahi wal fatih, wa ra'ayta nasa dhuluna fi dinillahi afwaja, fasabbih bihamdi rabbika wa staghfirhu innahu, he says, what is the meaning of this, of, this, of this surah? What does it teach? So some of them he said, he said this is the, the, the announcement of the Fatah. Some of them say, this is the announcement of victory. Some of them say this. He said, okay. Now listen to him, what he'll say. He says, قُلْ يَا بْنَ Abbas. Say to them, what is this, what is this surah talking about? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the victory of Allah comes and the conquest... And when you see people entering into the religion of Allah in groups, when you see this happening, you Muhammad, do the tasbih a lot, of the praise of your Lord, and seek his forgiveness, because he forgives everything. He says, huh? This was an announcement of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Umar says, "Ma alimtu illa hadu." This is what I know also. That's what Allah subhanahu wa taala was saying to His Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When you see the day when I'll give you the victory and the conquest of Makkah, now Makkah comes back to the Muslims, and you see people now coming to Islam, not individuals, groups, nations, then you should know your time has come. So what do you do when your time comes to an end? Increase in tasbih and istighfar. And all the sahaba accepted. Okay, now we know why he sits with us. Someone who knows the Quran. And this teaches you something else. When we say the Quran, nasih al Quran, this is what we mean. Not just reciting it. Not just reciting when you don't know the meaning. You have to learn the meaning of the Quran. All of ilm. All of knowledge, all of these books you see here, it comes from the Quran. The Sunnah explains the Quran. So the Quran is the source, the foundation. Then you go into the Sunnah. 
لكن it's sad. Wallah is very sad. And this teaches us that we have not fulfilled this nasiha properly. If we don't even know what is the meaning of tabbat yada bi lahabin wa tab. If we don't know the meaning of li ila fi Quraysh ila fihim rihla tashita yu saif. If we don't even know the meaning of alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabi al-fila. You don't even know the meaning of that. Then you want to say, oh, you know what? I don't like this sheikh. He's, he's not so good. Who are you? Who are you to speak? Who are you? You don't know the basic of the basics. Lan juzu'amma first. We have to learn the Quran. We have to learn the Quran. Inna hadha al-Quran yahdi lillati hiya aqwam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this Quran, it guides you to the best in everything. If you're suffering from stress, distress, anxiety, anguish, anger, whatever you're suffering from, Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ we have sent down in the Quran what is a cure. An nasiha lillahi then what? Wa li kitabihi to his book. And also to add to that from the nasiha to the book of Allah is that you treat the actual book, you treat it with respect. You are not supposed from the manners of the Quran, listen to me, especially young, young brothers and sisters. You don't carry the Quran with your left hand. You don't carry the Quran with your left hand. You carry the Quran with your right hand. The Quran is carried by the right hand. Like Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to say, the Prophet sallam, the right hand used to be good for good things, the left hand for bad and dirty things. That's why you use your left hand in the washroom. The right hand is for good things like the Quran. You carry the Quran in your right hand. And the way we were taught, you don't carry the Quran like you're carrying your bag, your briefcase. You carry the Quran close to your heart right there. You don't put the Quran somewhere dirty. You don't point your, foot, your feet towards the Quran. You don't point your feet towards the Quran. If you're sitting here, there's Mus'haf here, you don't point your feet. You don't put the Quran somewhere where there is dirt. I said that. You don't write in your Quran things which are unnecessary. If it's markings which are helping you to learn the Quran, that's okay. This is how much you have to glorify the Quran. That is why it's not allowed for you to carry the Quran into the washroom. That is how it's not allowed for you to give the Quran to someone who's mushrik. Only give him the English one. Don't give him the Arabic one, which is the actual Quran, the words of Allah. This is the nasiha to the book of Allah. You have to glorify it. You have to glorify it. You don't touch it if you don't have wudu, unless it's an, it's an extreme case, you have an excuse. This is how you honor the Quran. This is, how you, this is the nasiha to the book of Allah. As for the nasiha to the messenger, to his messenger, and nasiha to the leader of the Muslims, and nasiha to the general Muslims, this is what we'll discuss after. Salah, insha'Allah. If you have any questions, you have to write it down, insha'Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad, shabbalah. You don't touch this, huh?
استقالة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا Answer two questions, you get Kit Kat. <coughs> Can you please keep silence in the masjid? Keep silence in the masjid. Keep silence in the masjid. You want to talk, you leave. You want to talk, you go outside. And let me give you the good news it's minus 20 something. Simple. You don't have to repeat these things every day, subhanAllah. It's a masjid. People are praying. We want to start our halak. We have to wait for you to keep quiet. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa anna muhammadan abduhu rasooluhu ba'd. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Now, that is the nasiha to the book of Allah. And also included in that before we move on is to believe that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. And to refute and to rebuke anyone who criticizes or speaks bad of the book of Allah. Anyone who criticizes the book of Allah whether he is not Muslim or he is from the groups which claim they're Muslim, they, like the Shia to Rafida, those who claim that this Quran is changed, that they have the complete Quran. It is part of your duty. From the Nasiha to the Book of Allah, it's part of your duty, part of that Nasiha to defend the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it is from the non Muslims or from those people who claim to be Muslims. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, 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 he praised himself and he praised this book that he preserved it and he's going to preserve it. Allah says, we'll, we'll preserve this book. I 
الإمام البيهقي الإمام البيهقي in his book شعب الإيمان شعب الإيمان he brings this story from يحيى ابن أكثم القاضي يحيى ابن أكثم يحيى ابن أكثم was one of the judges he says كان لي جار يهودي I used to have a neighbor who was a Jew وكنت أدعوه إلى الإسلام and I used to call him into Islam I used to give him دعوة but he refused you know and he disappeared after exactly like one year he came back he came back and he said I want to give my shahad I want to accept Islam after one year he says that's good but I have to ask you where have you been for this one year that Yahudi he said he said you have been talking to me about Islam so I said let me take it myself to discover the truth فكتبت التوراة وحرفتها He says so I wrote the Torah the book of the Jews and I changed things in it ثم عرضته من اليهود then I gave it to the, to the Jews فعظموني and they glorified me and they glorified the book I wrote and they did not even notice anything and they sold it so much He says, so I knew that this is not the book of Allah. Qali said, Thumma katabtu li injil. Then I started to write the injil, which was sent to Isa alayhi salam, and I changed things from the injil we had. I changed. And then I went to the marketplace and presented it to the Christians, and they took it and they were so happy, and they honored me. ثم كتبت القرآن. I said now let me write the Quran. He says, فحرفت مواطن قليلة لم يفتن لها بسهولة. He says and I changed very specific things, very small things which you cannot find out easily. I changed not a lot of mistakes. I changed some things which no one can find out except someone who knows well the Quran. And I said, if this is the book of Allah, we'll know. He says, فَعَرَدْتُ إِلَى السُّكْ And I went to the marketplace and presented الوراقين to the warraqeen. The warraqeen are the people who write the Quran. Not even scholars. I presented to the warraqeen. You know, back then, like you have, you have today the typists. Someone's job is just to type. Those are called the warraqeen. He said, when I presented it to them and they looked at it, they threw it in my face. And they said, هذا محرف. This is changed. He says, فَقُلْتُ لِنَفْسِ هَذَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ So I said to myself, this is the book of Allah. Now I'm here to give my shahada. The book of Allah. From the nasiha we have to have for the book of Allah. We have to honor this book. And you have to understand something, brothers. Like we said, nasiha, it starts from the heart, but it has to be practical. You just don't say, yes, I believe in Allah. Yes, I have rights on, Allah has rights on me. No. There has to be practical, like we said. Who do you worship? Your intentions, who do you intend to please? For the book, do you actually read the book of Allah? Do you actually honor it? Do you actually learn it? Practically, not just saying. Next, so to move on, he says, Holy Rasuli, and Nasiha to his messenger. What does Nasiha to the messenger mean? It means first to believe in him. That is truly the messenger of Allah. Second, to believe that is the best of all the messengers. Third, you have to believe that he fulfilled his obligation of conveying the message of Allah. Fourth, you have to honor him and glorify him in the status which Allah has given him. Fifth, which is connected to that, you should not pass the limits in praising the Prophet. This is one of the rights he has on you. That you don't pass the limits in praising him. Just like he said to him, he said himself to you, La kama atratin nasara Isa ibn Maryam. Do not overpraise me like the Christians have overpraised Isa, the son of Maryam. That's one of the rights of the Prophet. And one of the rights which connected to that when you hear people over praising the Prophet, like making him a god. 
then it is part of your duty, part of your nasiha for him, that you stay the people, no, this is wrong. Part of the nasiha to the Prophet وسلم, after believing in him, like we said, is to follow him, because that's the obligation you have him. That's the obligation you have upon you from him, which has been transmitted by him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Omar salna rasuna illa li uta'a bi idhnillah. We have not sent a messenger except that it should be obeyed. And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a test. Qul, say to them Muhammad, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah. If you claim you love Allah, if you claim you have nasiha for Allah and his messenger, fattabi'uni, follow me. Following is only practical. وَمَنْ يُطِعُ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ Allah says, whoever obeys the messenger, obeying is what? The definition of obeying is that you listen to a command and then you practice it. Once you listen to the command of the Prophet ﷺ in his hadith, and then you practice it, now you have obeyed the messenger. Once you have obeyed the messenger, you have obeyed Allah. That is nasiha to Allah and then his messenger. That you defend his sunnah. From all deviations which have entered from all false information which people try to ascribe to the Prophet ﷺ. This is part of the obligation you have. It's an obligation. It's part of the nasiha to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to defend his sunnah and to teach people his sunnah and to raise up his sunnah. Like he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّةِ فَرَيْسَ مِنِّي The one who turns away from my sunnah is not from me. And the opposite is true. The one who holds on to my sunnah is part of me. These are the rights of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to be practical in our nasiha to his Prophet ﷺ. Do you understand? And this is the shahada which you took, like we say today in the khutbah. When you said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah When you said, I testify Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, it means one thing. I have to follow him. That's what it means. That you honor his sunnah. Everything which he said, Part of the nasiha is that you do what he did. That is part of love for the Prophet He said, wear your shoe first, the first, the right foot. You wear the shoes, right foot, then left foot. You're supposed to do that. Every single thing, small or big, which he taught you and he did, you're supposed to do that. That is the nasiha to the Prophet Then, then, we'll have submitted. Then we'll have submitted. Then we'll have nasiha, pure nasiha to the Prophet. And then the Prophet وسلم, will just summarize. He said, المسلمين, And to the leaders of the Muslims, you have to have nasiha for them. Fulfill your obligation which you have towards them. Now this part, I would like to read what Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he explained. How he explained this part beautifully. He says, Aimmatul Muslimin, the leaders of the Muslims in fun, there are two groups. The first one, Al-Ulama, the scholars. He says, and what is intended by the scholars? العلماء الربانيون الذين ورثوا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم علما وعبادة وأخلاقا ودعوة. He said what we mean by scholars, those who took and inherited from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in their knowledge and their ibada, their worship and their akhlaq, their manners and their da'wa. They call to the same thing the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم called. And this negates and filters out all those puppets, all those actors who claim they are calling people to Islam, but they are not calling to the Prophet ﷺ in his way. They are not calling to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Those are not considered scholars. 
a scholar is someone like Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, he said he said it the best way. He has inherited from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al Ulama Warathatul Anbiya, the scholars they inherit from the Prophet. Same thing, the knowledge he had, the aqidah he taught, the ibadah, how did he practice Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The akhlaq he had, the manners he had, and the da'wah, what do they call to? Do they call to the same thing the Prophet called to? Those are the scholars we're talking about here. So when we say nasiha to the leader of the Muslims, the first leaders are the scholars. These are the scholars. Not just anyone who wears a kufi, a cap, and a beard, and a thobe. Well, some of them they don't put on the thobe. They want to be modernistic, if that word exists. So they put on that suit and a tie. Oh, he dances for you on the stage. He dances for you to please you. You are his student, so he has to dance for you. Do a jiggle or something. That is not someone you take ilm from. He says next, And these are the real leaders. He says these scholars, they are the real leaders. Because the leaders, political leaders, they listen to them and need them. And the general Muslims, they need them. These are the true leaders. Number two of the leaders are the leaders of the Muslims, meaning the rulers. The rulers. So you have to have nasiha to the scholars and the rulers of the Muslims. Now, how, what is the nasiha to the, to the scholars? What is it? How do you fulfill it? He says, أول فاست محبتهم لأنك إذا لم تحب أحدا فإنك لن تتأسى به. You have to love them. You have to love them. Just like you cannot have nasiha for Allah if you don't love Him. You can have not have nasiha to His book if you don't love His book. You cannot have nasiha to His prophet if you don't love Him. And this teaches you something. The real nasiha, it is coming from the fountain of love. He says, number one, loving the scholars. Number two, مَعُونَتَهُمْ وَمُسَاعَدَتَهُمْ فِي بَيَانِ الْحَقِّ فَتُنْشِرْ كُتُبُهُمْ بِالْوَسَائِلِ الْإِعْلَامِيَ الْمُتَنَوِّعَ Is helping them to spread the message. It's part of the nasiha you have, the duty you have towards the scholars. Helping them to spread the message. It can be either by spreading their books or their lectures through the different ways you can do it. Number three, الذبو أن أعراضهم To protect their honor and to defend them. He says, what does that mean? ألا تقر أحدا على غيبتهم ولا على غيبتهم والوقوع في أعراضهم That you don't accept from anyone to backbite or to slander any of the scholars. When you hear that happening, what do you do? He says, min You try to verify what this person is saying about this scholar. Is it true or not? You try to verify. He says, فَكَمْ مِنْ أَشْيَاءِ النُّسِبَةِ لَا عَالِمُ وَهِيَ كَذِبٌ He says, how many things People, they say, this, this sheikh said this, but it is lies. This happens so much. So much. He says, so you have to verify what this person is talking about. This Is it true or not? Number two. Once you have known that, let's say it's true. He says, This thing which you heard this person saying about the scholar. Is it really something to be criticized for or not? Maybe it's not something wrong. Maybe it's not something wrong. He says, لِأَنَّهُ قَدْ يَبْدُوا لِلْإِنسَانِ فِي أَوَّلِ وَهْلَةٍ أَنَّ الْقَوْلُ مُنْتَقِدْ وَعِنْدَ التَّأَمُّ يَرَى أَنَّهُ حَقٍّ He says, because someone might think, oh, this is really a mistake, this call I did. But then after you think about it, you see, no, it's not something to be criticized for. Number three, now when you know that this thing is not something to be criticized for, now it is a must for you to go back to number one. 
to defend and protect the honor of this scholar. And you say to that person, no, don't speak bad about this sheikh or that alim, because that thing is not wrong. And that you clarify to this person what he said is actually right. And this is the proof and this and that. That is our duty towards the scholars. Number four. Now the other scenario. If it actually turns out that what he said was wrong, what do you do? He says, فالواجب أن تتصل بهذا العالم بأدب ووقار وتقول سمعت أنك كذا وكذا وأحب أن تبين لي وجه ذلك لأنك أعلم مني. It says your duty is to call that scholar between you and him and clarify. He says with manners and ask him, I heard Sheikh you said this and that. Please inform me. Please inform me because you are more knowledgeable than me. Why did you say this? He says, if he tells you why he said that and you still think or you see that he's wrong, he says then you debate with him and have a dialogue with him with manners. With manners. He says, and this is the part I wanted to mention, as for what some of the ignorant people they do, the jahala, those who come to a scholar because he said something which they don't say. He holds an opinion which they don't hold. Huh? They come to him with toughness. And even sometimes they put their hands in the face of this scholar. And they say to him, what is this innovation you're bringing? ما هذا القول منكر ولا this strong statement you're saying وأنت لا تخاف الله you don't fear Allah he says وأنت لا تخاف الله but rather you don't fear Allah وبعد التأمل تجد العالم موافقا للحديث وهم المخالفون له he said but after you if you took your time you find that the scholars are the one who has the dalil from the hadith of the Prophet Sallam. And they are the ones who are opposing the hadith. He says, وَغَالِبْ مَا يُؤْتُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ مِنْ إِعْجَابِهِمْ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ He said that most of the times, these people, they suffer this disease because they have that great disease, which is what? Al-Ujb. They are amazed by themselves. وَذَنِّهِمْ And they think, أنهم على أنهم هم أهل السنة and that they think that they are the real people of the Sunnah وأنهم الذين على طريق السلف and they think that they are the ones who are on the way of the Salaf وهم أبعد ما يكون على طريق السلف عن السنة but rather Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin he says they are so far away from the Sunnah and the way of the Salaf and we see this here we see this here This disease, the Sheikh put it very, very well. Not every mistake which comes from a scholar or a Sheikh or a Da'i, you're supposed to hasten. He says the Thabbut. First find out, why did he say that? Then did he really say that? There's so many sheikhs these days who fell into this trap. Someone calls him sheikh. What do you say about Abdul Aziz? He said this and that and that. And that sheikh who's sitting somewhere in Saudi or wherever he's sitting says, Mubtaliya, innovator. Don't sit in his dars. He's not of the sunnah. He don't even know him. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, one of the greatest scholars of our time. He says, call, find out. This is another Muslim. And this will come in the Ammat al-Muslimin, from the rights of other Muslims. It's not just to attack them like that. When you find out it's true, he says, talk in manners. Don't just think you are the only one who is a representative of Ahl-Sunnah. You have the 
green card of Ahl Sun. You're the only one who's going to Jannah. Who gave you that passport? Where do we apply also? Please give us those passports also. You are the only one who's the Salafi. You are the only one who's on the manhaj of the Salaf. Everybody else is lost. When you never talk to other people, you never ask them, why do you do this? Maybe like the Sheikh said, he is the one who has the proof you don't have anything. It's a disease. Number five, to move on, he says, He says, now from the duties we have on the scholars, from the Nasihal, the scholars, when you see the scholar making a mistake, if he said something wrong, you know for sure this is wrong. He said, it is not part of Nasiha for you to keep quiet. No, no. Don't say, he says, Hada a'lamu minni. He says, no. Don't say, oh, he's more knowledgeable than me. No. He says, bal tunaqash bi adabu ahtiram. He says, rather you should go to him and speak to him with respect and manners and say to him you made you said this and that and this is wrong with manners and respect says because someone he cannot know everything something he does not know so someone who's lower than him in knowledge he can tell him that he says and that is okay what you see what he said you go to him you talk to him with adab and ihtiram, manners and respect. You don't just right away flash your iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy, whatever, and all the way up on Twitter or those forums you write. You're happy when someone makes a mistake. You're learning from your grandfather, the shaitan. The shaitan is the one who's happy when a Muslim makes a mistake, especially a Muslim who teaches people good. When you see someone making a mistake, you should not be happy. You go and try to correct it. If you know he's doing it intentionally, then yes, you warn the people of his mistake. And this is called the vulture culture. You know the vultures? You know the vultures? Those who eat the carcass. What do the vulture do? All they do all day long, they just sit there and wait for someone to die. <laughs> That's what they do. Vultures don't eat people, don't eat alive, don't eat uh, animals who are alive, right? They eat the carcass. They are called scavengers, the vultures. Huh? This is called the vulture culture. People who have their ears open, all they do is just they want to hear their mistakes on. The good you say, you talked for one and a half hours, you said so many good things, you made that one slip. Maybe it's not even a mistake, your tongue slipped. That's the only thing he learned from you. This is what is called the vulture culture. And alhamdulillah, we don't have it here so much in this masjid. Next he says, from the nasiha to the scholars, and tadullahum ala khayri ma yakunu fi da'watin nas is that you tell and you advise the scholars the best way the best way how they're going to make their message reach the people he gave an example the sheikh he said if you know the people they don't like to be talked to every day then you go to the sheikh and advise him and say these people this dars of every day they get bored they don't learn anything so make it maybe every other day he says this is part of the nasiha that you help the sheikh in reaching there and how he's going to convey and reach the message. Now he goes on the nasiha to the leaders of the Muslims. Nasiha to the leaders of the Muslims. He says, number one, that you take them to be leaders, yes, and you respect them. You respect them. Number two, nashru mahasinihim fi ra'iya. You spread the good which they do onto the people. You inform the people of the good which they do so that the people will love them. When they love them, then the people will 
be disciplined and orderly. And there'll be order and peace in the Islamic community. Islam is a religion of order and discipline. It's not a religion of chaos. That you spread the good which they do. Some people, again, they only see the bad from, this, from the leaders. Did you see that, that Amir, what he did, that prince? You saw the, the, the plane he's riding in? It's $10 million. Can they give that to the poor? It's true, maybe. But that's the only thing you know about him. What about those 10 million copies of the Mus'haf he printed and gave people? You didn't see that. Actually, you saw it because you read from one of those copies and you have it in your house. But you don't speak of that. You understand? Don't be someone who always just sees people's mistakes. Al-Jahid. Al-Jahid is famous. He wrote which book? Al-Jahid, you know what he says? He says, Tajidu. Akhtharu nasu aiban. The people who have the most deficiencies and bad qualities are the people who talk bad most about people. He says, you'll find the people of the most bad qualities. You know who are those people? You'll find them, they're the people who talk bad about most people. So it only comes back to them. He says you spread their good. Next. Is to obey them in everything which they command you as long as it does not contradict the sharia of Allah, the book and the sunnah. You obey the leaders in everything they command you as long as it does not contradict the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet So if the leader says from today we'll have traffic lights, don't come and say no, Umar never had traffic lights. The Prophet never had traffic lights. That's not how you understand the deen. Traffic lights and other systems like those, they do not contradict Islam. In fact, they help us to be good Muslims. They put order in the community, in the society. Some people, they understand it like that. No, no. Taib. You obey the leaders in anything and everything which does not contradict the sunnah of the Prophet Number four, he says that you hide their mistakes and...